It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Clement Muo from Cambridge. Professor Muo obtained his doctor's degree under the supervision of Professor Villani at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon in 2004. His main subject is nonlinear partial differential equations in kinetic theory. His work on Katz's program in kinetic theory was adopted as a subject of Wolfhaki seminar. He was awarded Whitehead Prize of London Mathematical Society and Grand Prix to Madame Victor Nui of French Academy of Sciences. Today, the title of his talk, lecture is the George Nash-Moser and Herbander theories, new interplays. Let's welcome Professor Mu. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you uh, to the, all the organizers for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to participate the ICM. So this talk, in this talk, I'll try to present an overview of a new line of research, um, trying to explain where it comes from historically. So it is, uh, these are a set of questions and conjectures about one of the main classes of PDs in mathematical physics, the kinetic equation, so I will explain that. And it's based on collaborations with various people, I'll mention that along the way. And after describing the conjectures, the state of the art, I'll focus on the two main conceptual steps. The first one giving the title to this talk. So hopefully you'll understand the title along the way. Okay, so introduction. I'll give you the main context, motivation and conjectures. So, so this platform is dangerous, so I'll try not to fall. Yeah, so after after the first concept of thermodynamics and entropy uh, in the 18th, 19th century, Maxwell proposed uh, a mathematical formulation in a paper that starts uh, statistical mechanics, 1867, where Maxwell writes down an equation that is now known as the Boltzmann equation, but he writes the weak form of it, and he proposes to describe position variable and kinetic variable that gives the name to the theory that is not accessible to observation in, an, uh, in a statistical manner. And uh, the main equation is this Boltzmann equation. So it's a PDE, non-local, you have an integral, where the unknown is a non-negative density probability. So it's slightly different from fluid mechanics, but I'll explain the link in a second. And this right-hand side is the so-called Boltzmann collision operator that is here. So you see this complicated double integral. It's quadratic, and it's acting only along V, and it has a structure of a tensor product of the function the unknown F. Last point, very important for this talk. When you're describing uh, long distance interactions between the particles in your gas, this operator has actually fractional ellipticity, meaning that uh, this kernel will be singular. So, let's, let me say a few more words on this operator so that you get some intuition, some feeling for this theory. The operator looks complicated, but after all, it's nothing but a statistical balance sheet of particles appearing and disappearing in the velocity space due to collisions. That's just this. If you, oh, ah, yeah. Here it means minus, I have velocity V, I collide with velocity V, V star, and I disappear. Here is a plus, meaning I am produced with velocity V by a collision V prime, V prime star, where the velocity satisfies the collision rules, which are here. Okay, so that's the uh, collision operator, and the kernel here describes really the interaction. The main kernels were computed by Maxwell. I write them here so that you get an idea of the conjectures, because you have a beautiful family of models uh, connected in sort of continuous way by the parameters. So the hard spheres case is the simplest one intuitively. This is the billiard, solid balls colliding by contact. And in that case, Maxwell 
in the representation I've given so far, wrote down the collision kernel here. He also computed in the same paper what happens with inverse power forces, repulsive, which are proportional to the distance r to the power minus alpha for some alphas. And here the form is not as explicit, but it's still pretty nice in the sense that it's a product of a power of modulus v minus v star, so the relative velocity between the particles colliding, and a function b of the cosinus of the angle between v minus v star and v prime minus v prime star, and you have these formulas for gamma, depending on alpha, and you have here a, a negative power for theta, where the 2s here depends on alpha. Okay, so you can't remember all these formulas, but the key point is that for this class of equation, this plays the role of the growth or decay of a coefficient in a, a PD. And this plays the role of the fractional order of differentiation of the operator. And you have a whole terminology, maxwell molecules, hard potential, soft, very soft. So what you should get out of that is the softer means the longer range is the interaction and the harder it is to deal with mathematically. And Maxwell has been given, uh, this name has been given as a tribute. The limit case alpha equals two is ill-defined actually. You cannot plug alpha equals two and compute the Boltzmann operators. And uh, Landau, the, the Russian physicist proposed in the 30s this replacement. So I wrote it for a general gamma because to do mathematics, we, we, we extend it unphysically to a whole range of gamma, but the physical case really is gamma equals minus three. And this provides you with a, a beautiful non-local drift diffusion operator. So this is the same thing. Here I rewrite it as a drift diffusion operator with non-local coefficients a and b. So these two equations, Boltzmann and Lambda equations, I'll try to convince you that they are fundamental. They are at a <coughs> lower level, meaning closer to first principle level of descriptions than fluid mechanics, and they in some sense include fluid mechanics. So Maxwell in the first paper observed that this particular steady state, this particular stationary solution cancels the collision operator. So what is this? It's, uh, it's just a Gaussian with diagonal variance. And it's of course related to the central limit theorem that this solution cancel the collision operator, and you see the parameters rho, t, and u are exactly what you would expect them to be in fluid mechanics, local density, mean velocity, and temperature. Boltzmann starts from that, observes that Maxwell has not proved that this particular solution attracts the dynamics, and this is his major discovery, what is really known for, and the reason the equation bears his name, he uh, proposes in this 1872 paper, the so-called H theorem. The letter H, by the way, is, comes from a typographic mistake. It's really a theorem about the entropy, but it's, known now, it's now known as the H theorem. And the, it's really mathematically meaning he finds a Lyapunov function. But this function is also connected to physics, it's very deep, and, and this is a major discovery. Okay, so Boltzmann and Landau equation are connected to classical mechanic equations on rho u and t. I don't have time here to write down the precise scaling. At the formal level, it was known a long time ago, but we now have uh, a lot of rigorous results. Uh, Bardos, Goltz, Levermore, Grenier, Lyons, Mass, Moody. And uh, let me just describe this, this last one. Francois Goltz and Laure saint Raymond managed to connect rigorously uh, any global weak solutions of Boltzmann to the Leray weak solutions of incompressible Navier-Stokes. That's probably the uh, most definitive result so far. So at the other hand of the scales, so boltzmann lambda equations sort of include fluid dynamics. Now if you um, go to particles at the microscopic level, and if you combine the ideas of introduced by Maxwell, treating things statistically, combined with uh, an extremely important insight, uh, uh, revolutionary insight of Boltzmann, the idea of molecular chaos, you can connect formally the Newton equations to Boltzmann equation, and this was done by Grad in the United States in the 50s. However, the rigorous proof of the uh, sketch, formal sketch of Grad, was only obtained by uh, the late Landford in Switzerland in 75. This is a major breakthrough in mathematical physics. It's, however, extremely frustrating that it's limited to small time, 
But let me emphasize that this result of land four that was extended, revisited in these references is one of the very, very few results that connect uh, rigorously a reversible m many uh, degrees of freedom uh, dynamical system to an irreversible nonlinear PD dynamics. So you can think of uh, Bunimovic Sinai, for instance. These sort of results are extremely deep and hard. So this is one such result. However, it's for a short time, very small time. And uh, first question, we don't have equivalent of this for long-range interactions, Boltzmann or Landau, so that's a major open problem. Another frustrating aspect is that it is not enough to solve the so-called Hilbert 6 problem, the axiomatization of mechanics, which is really deriving rigorously fluid mechanics from Newton, and Hilbert suggested to go through kinetic theory in between. And the reason that uh, you, the reason uh, you cannot solve Hilbert 6 problem by combining Landford and um, Gold Saint Raymond, for instance, is that the time scales are, are simply incompatible. When you perform the fluid limit, the Landford time becomes essentially zero. So we would need to understand this limit on a much longer time. Okay, so these equations are fundamental. I'm cheating a little bit because lambda equation has never been derived from the Newton laws, that would be a, a, an important uh, breakthrough. But however, since it can be obtained by, through the Boltzmann equation, we can still sort of call it fundamental if we are nice to it. So uh, when you have fundamental equations of physics, the first thing you want to do, and that's not what I'm going to do, but still, let's, let's go through this first, is to solve the Cauchy problem. And as you can expect, uh, it will be hard, but the first little steps that have been done uh, the short time solutions, I mean, have been constructed for all the family I mentioned, this whole family of interaction, Boltzmann and in the limit case Landau. More interestingly, we have also built global solutions close to the stationary solutions, starting with Ukai in the 70s and, and then a lot, a lot of work uh, in the last decades, or with special homogeneity starting with Karleman, Arkerin, and a lot of other people, so additional symmetry. The, f the only result we have so far that doesn't impose smallness or additional symmetry was the breakthrough of Dipernay and Lyons in 89. That was sort of extended, extended to the Landau equation with an additional defect measure, so in an even weaker sense by Alexandre and Villani later on. The construction of strong solution with a uniqueness principle remains uh, in the large remains a formidable open problem, and you can compare it uh, to the millennium problem of the regularity of solutions to 3D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. The Dipernalion solution would play the role of Leray solution of 1933. Uh, you can even argue that it, it might even be a harder problem, because in some sense you derive incompressible Navier-Stokes from this equation. Okay, so if you can't solve that, uh, there was a very deep remark uh, by Trudel and Mooncaster in 1980 in a famous uh, treaty on kinetic theory. And I think it's a, good, uh, it's a good thing to keep in mind for us mathematicians. Essentially what they are saying, you see the quote here, what they are saying is uh, stop obsessing on the, uh, on the Cauchy problem, try to do something meaningful from the viewpoint of mathematical physics, try to understand uh, how they formulate is nice, to discover and specify the circumstances that give rise to solutions which persist forever. And after that only you will construct solutions. So I doubt, I'm, I'm not convinced by the last sentence, but certainly this is really a good advice. We should try to do something meaningful without waiting for the Cauchy problem to be solved. And Cherchinianich, soon after trying to answer this, formulated a precise conjecture on the entropy production relating it to the relative entropy. So I won't have time to, to show much of the details on that. Let me just say that this church in any conjecture was the beginning of a long series of beautiful works, Carlen, Carvalho, Toscani, Venberg, Villani, uh, about the, the entropy production. So in view of church in any conjecture, the question of Trudel Mooncaster, here is a first conjecture about this Boltzmann and Landa equation. So, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it says that if you give me any a priori solution in a space that is as large as possible, so what, what do I ask? I want a solution that is bounded pointwise in space, integrable in V with enough 
decay to be able to define the energy. Then it will converge to the uh, stationary solution, the equilibrium, with the optimal rate predict pred predicted by the linearized equation, which for instance for the billiard balls is exponential. So there are lots of works on that. This is linearized, UKI, homogeneous with the optimal rate. David Villani provided the first result in the large, a priori in the large, with polynomial rates. This is linearized, and we combine here the, line, the quantitative linearized study and the, in the large result to give the optimal, uh, to answer this conjecture for hard spheres. The conjecture is, uh, it, 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 well, we develop specific methods to connect uh, the linearized theory to the theory in the large and this method is used at the moment to solve the conjecture for other interactions. So with Carapatozo, Michler, Tristani, Wu, and others now. So the second thing we could try to do without being able to solve the Cauchy problem is now to turn to long-range interaction and try to understand regularity. So let me, let me remind you a little bit of the setting. If we go, sorry, if we go to long-range interactions, the Boltzmann and the landau coulomb operators show local ellipticity if you assume pointwise bounds, for instance, on the local hydrodynamical field, so local density, local energy, and local entropy. It's not hard to imagine why, because the coefficients, remember the drift diffusion equation, the coefficients are averages of the solution in V. So whereas it is, as I just said, reasonably clear for the landau coulomb operator locally, you get local ellipticity, uh, it was understood about two decades ago in the case of the Boltzmann collision operator, starting with the seminal work of Devilet on a simplified operator called Katz operator, followed by Lyons, Villani, Alexandre, Van Berg, and then optimized by a lot of other colleagues. So, Okay, that's an interesting remark that will lead me to the core conjectures I will talk about. Because of these observations, specifically the, the, these works, it led some colleagues outside kinetic theory, and that's nice to have link between different communities, like Silves, Galdani, and Guillen. Uh, so more coming from non-local non -local operators and fully non-linear elliptic problems, to try to use barriers techniques, uh, the sort of things you use in the krilov safonov theory, if, if it if it tells you something, to obtain pointwise bounds uh, on the solutions and try to break the Cauchy theory. Okay, so, so that was maybe a little bit optimistic, but you never know, you have to try things. So they wanted really to solve the big, big difficulty. It turns out that it didn't work. It doesn't mean it was not worth trying, but uh, after these unsuccessful attempts, uh, it attracted more attention, uh, the attention of a larger community. And uh, these people I mentioned, me, uh, Cyril, and uh, a few others, we arrived at the following conditional regularity conjecture. So if you consider any solution to Boltzmann, Longrange, or Landau, so I don't write a complete definition, but you need the solution to have enough integrability and regularity so that you can define the equation, of course. So just give me the, the minimal um, space in which you can make sense of a weak solution to the equation. So uh, this solution is given a priori uh, on a time interval zero t, and I assume that I have bounds on, again, the hydrodynamical fields. Then the solution is bounded and smooth on zero t. So bounded to be, to be clear, I mean bounded for, for each time, and also bounded uniformly in time if you're a little bit away from zero in the, the time zero. You can play a little bit with this conjecture. You could, you could strengthen the, the, the initial condition here by allowing some vacuum in some places of the domain and just asking that you bound the mass on the average. Uh, you can weaken the conjecture by putting more at time zero as long as you only put this for all time. This should remain your only a priori assumption on the time interval. So one way to understand this conjecture is that it's, it's uh, a way to try to understand supercriticality, think to the bill kato maida criterion uh, in the Navier-Stokes theory. So I'm just, I'm just saying in some sense that this controls possible development of singularity. So if you turn it around, it means that development of singularity, if any, must happen at the level of the hydrodynamics. 
Um, two, two small remarks. Uh, I use the word supercriticality. However, we don't have a precise notion of the scalings and the criticality that you have for dispersive equations. That would be interesting to, to make progress on understanding that. So in kinetic theory, we don't have such clear notion of what it is to be subcritical or supercritical. However, I use this idea, it's, it's rather clear intuitively. And another small comment, for short-range interactions like billiard balls, um, a, a smaller open problem that is not solved right now is to prove the conditional propagation of regularity. Okay, so let me briefly mention the results obtained so far on the condi conditional regularity conjecture, and then I'll focus on some main, the two main steps I want to emphasize. So, the first breakthrough was, is, is the following. So it's a collaboration with Francois Gold, Cyril Lambert, and Alexis Vasseur. It's about, it's about to appear. Um, and this statement, there's a typo I forgot to say, solution of the Landau equation. Sorry for that. So these are solutions to the Landau equation. Um, you assume that you have bounds on your hydrodynamical fields. You assume that the solution solves the, the equation on a certain uh, domain. So ball cross ball cross some time interval. Uh, so it's purely conventional. Don't pay attention to the fact that I have a negative time. I'm not solving anything backward. It's just a convention coming from the parabolic theory. Um, and then the solution is actually elder continuous in a smaller domain. So this is the standard uh, Hölder regularity you expect from the De Georgi Nash Moser theory. Uh, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, except that the Landau equation is not parabolic, it's hypoelliptic. So that's, that's the key point we have to discuss. And the shortcomings in this statement is that it's local. You would love to have bounds that are global. Uh, the pointwise bond is on the right hand side, whereas you would like to generate it from the integral bond. But of course, for such a nonlinear PD, it's, it's a lot to ask. And we would like to go to higher regularity. I also want to mention that. In a different way, uh, 15 years before, uh, it was advocated in the Cour Peco at Collège de France by Villani to use um, not exactly the De Georgi version of the De Georgi Nash theory, but the Nash version for the Boltzmann equations. These were in oral lectures, uh, not published, but it was very much a premonitory to what happened afterwards. Okay, so the state of the, of the art on the conjectures is the following. So it's a whole series of work. What, what, is, what is the spirit? Um, what, what is the, the, the message of it? Is that we have a full answer for the unphysical Landau equation with moderately soft potential. We are close to a full answer with this last paper to um, solving the conjecture for Boltzmann equation with moderately soft potential and we are far from any answer in the very soft potential case. And we probably need new ideas for very long range interactions, which is very interesting, but for the moment seems very hard. So the, 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 the steps decompose usually as follow. If we take the case of Boltzmann, so Louis Sylvestre had obtained at about the same time we were working on the Georgi Nash mother theory, uh, pointwise bounds for Boltzmann equation for moderately soft. And uh, afterwards, with Cyril Lambert, they obtain local Elder regularity by sort of modifying, uh, or they, they prove a so-called so weak arnak inequality, and he used one argument we had in our paper. So it was a, the, the, the whole, uh, this whole series of work were, were interplaying in some sense. And in this one, we prove uh, the propagation and appearance if you have hard potentials of uh, pointwise polynomial decay at every order. And what remains now to be done for Boltzmann is the Schauder estimate to get higher regularity. And pretty much the same scheme, you, you can find the same pattern for Landau equation. Um, this, this one proves some pointwise bond, this one proves the Schauder estimate. And the first uh, step was this, this theorem about the Helder regularity. Okay, so now let me describe a little bit uh, the extension of the Georgi Nash Moser to. Uh, hypoelliptic equations. So Hermander is well known for this hypoelliptic theory, but I'll explain that. And I want to go back a little bit back uh, in the history of the, the Georgi Nash Moses theory. 
the Georgian Nash were both motivated by solving the so-called Hilbert 19th problem. So in it, one of these problems that Hilbert proposed in the first ICM, actually, in 1900 in Paris. And this 19th problem was uh, motivated by uh, calculus of variation and mechanics. So it's, it's one of the most fundamental problems you could think of in calculus of variation. It's approving the analytic regularity of minimizers u to uh, this sort of energy functional, where L is a Lagrangian satisfying such and such assumptions, typically smoothness, growth, and convexity. So we, we know, of course, by now, the first thing we, we want to do is to write down the Euler-Lagrange equations for this problem, which uh, gives us a non-divergence form, nice elliptic equation, but this coefficient bij, of course, if you take the simplest Dirichlet energy, you see that it's just, uh, just a constant, so you, you, you go back to the heat equation. But if you consider minimal surface energy, for instance, you'll have nonlinear coefficients here in terms of the solution u. So that's what makes the problem hard, is that you have a quasi-linear problem with these coefficients depending on the solution. What was known at the time was the following. Uh, if you know u as uh, uh, all the derivatives exist, somehow you will manage to prove a non-zero radius of convergence and prove analyticity. I'm simplifying, but that's sort of the idea. If you, um, if you know enough uh, good assumptions on L and the domain, you will prove a pointwise bound on the gradient, so Lipschitz. You will prove that U is Lipschitz. What can you do in between? Well, we know how to bootstrap regularity from an elliptic equation by the so-called Schauder theory if the coefficients are at least older. However, the coefficients depend on the gradient of U, so what was missing was really to prove that U is a little bit better than Lipschitz. And that's, that's what this theory was doing. If you look at one derivative of U, it solves a divergent form elliptic equation, and the Georgian Nash did, in different ways, answer this question. They proved um, elliptic case, parabolic case, but both were supplied to both cases that uh, the solution F is actually older continuous. The proof of the Georgi, which is the one I want to extend here, relies on an iteration gave gain of integrability and some isoperimetric argument to control the oscillations. Uh, the proof of Nash, which I will not use, it will be very interesting to extend it as well, is based on different ingredients, the direct study of the fundamental solution, uh, a very nice uh, use of what we call now Nash inequality, and the derivation of the entropy along time for the equation. And the proof of Moser is also different. Uh, the, the iterative gain of integrability resembles the Georgi, but there's a very different argument relying on the Poincaré inequality afterwards that is, uh, again, different. I, uh, let me also mention there's a lot of open problems in this area, but that's also another open problem. Uh, very, very nice. Um, is there an equivalent of the non-divergence uh, form theory by Krilov Safonov for this hypoelliptic equation. So I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll, I'll show you what it means uh, precisely on an equation. It's not even clear that it's correct, but it's a nice question. So what is hypoellipticity? The name is largely associated to uh, Hermander, but of course it, it became before. We can trace it back at least to the short note of Kolmogorov in German. Uh, 34, 1934, where Kolmogorov is trying to understand the so-called time-integrated Brownian motion. Okay, so in the simplest case, it means, uh, let's say, take X and V in R, dimension one, and look at this nice PD. What this PD describes is uh, uh, X dot dot equals Brownian, equals noise, right? It's the simplest thing, that's why it's called time-integrated Brownian motion. And uh, Kolmogorov, by Fourier analysis, just solves that. Writes down the fundamental solution starting from a Dirac mass, where, on which you can see the reg regularization in all variables. And this is, uh, on the first page, the beginning of the paper of Hermander 67, he starts from this observation that the solution of Kolmogorov is regularizing, and he develops a whole theory for that based on commutator estimates. So the message of this slide is really commutator estimates, because I hope I'll have time to get to get to a, a nice uh, trajectorial commutator estimate in the end. And <clears throat> it's been revisited recently uh, with the so-called hypocoercivity theory, but let, let me skip that. 
So here is uh, the typical result we established. It's slightly simplified. I removed some, some other terms in the paper, but here is the sort of things you should think of in, in this uh, extended uh, De Georgi Nash model theory. You take uh, an equation that has the kinetic structure, you know, transport on the left hand side and an, opera uh, an operator only in V in the right hand side. And here your diffusion matrix is uh, supposed to be only measurable, so no regularity, but has these two bounds. That's crucial in the theory. You need ellipticity bounds. And then uh, the conclusion is exactly similar to what you expect for parabolic equations. If you have a solution F in a certain cube, then, and it's L2, then it will be pointwise bounded and elder regular in a smaller cube. And the constants are so-called, we say, universal. They don't depend on the solution, of course. They only depend on uh, the various dimension and, and exponents. So there was, a, again, of an infinity. This part had been done in a slightly different way uh, by Pascucci and Polidoro. And there was a, a related, uh, proved very differently, Hölder regularity results by Wang and Zhang that seemed much harder to export based on a modified Poincaré inequality. So let me explain briefly that before going to the next step, the, the second conceptual point. So I'll start very basic. This is the iteration, the De Georgi Moser iteration. For the expert, I use the Moser presentation, uh, but I could, I, could, I could show the De Georgi way to present it. They are very much equivalent. For the simplest elliptic equation, take that, only one variable, let's call it V. It's convenient for me from the next slide. And A is a nice matrix bounded above, below, uh, and not regular, just measurable. What you can do here is the basic energy estimate, what the, the sort of thing you learn in basic PD class. You multiply that by F and a nice cutoff function, and you extract from the coercivity of this operator a control in H1 and a smaller ball. The, the QR1 is where your cutoff function is valued 1, and your cutoff function is 0 out of QR0. You have two cubes, one into each other. And of course, the error terms will be controlled by this and that. So that's L2 on the source, L2 on the function, and you pay a price, which is the uh, value of your cutoff function uh, when it, it goes, to, sorry, the value of the gradient of your cutoff function when it goes from one to zero uh, in, in this short layer, small layer between QR0, QR1. Okay, and that's it, essentially. Once you have that, you Sobolev embed the left-hand side to gain some integrability above L2. And the, the, the beauty of this argument is that you can redo it for any power of the solution, for any sub-solution. So you can gain more and more integrability, reducing to a smaller and smaller cube. And the way this inequality scales in a nonlinear way means that, in spite of the fact that this constant is blowing up, you can still have a convergent infinite product and obtain L infinity in a smaller cube. Okay, so now in the parabolic case, there's not much more to do. It's essentially the same argument. You perform the basic uh, energy estimate on this parabolic equation. You have this term here, which is quite nice actually. You just have to be careful to use a cutoff function which is one at the, the final time and zero at the initial time. But it's very standard in parabolic theory. And this term will give you by Sobolev embedding the gain of integrability. And you have to iterate similarly. Now, in the kinetic case, so think about this equation. Now you have a problem. You perform the standard energy estimate. So here is the, your error term. You pay a price the gradient of the cutoff. And here in red is the gain of regularity from the operator. And you only gain regularity in the second variable, not in space. So of course, if you worked in kinetic theory or in hypoelliptic equations in general, you know exactly what you want to do when you see that. You want to use a commutator. So in kinetic theory, the way we use commutators in this context is called averaging lemma. But it has a lot of conceptual similarity with the commutators used in Norman the theory. I want to commute in some sense the gain of V regularity, the grad V, with my transport operator. So um, 
this I'll explain in a second averaging lemma, but there's another problem is that you want to apply that to any sub-solutions, meaning you have poten potentially a right-hand side, a source term that is as bad as measure. And averaging lemma don't like that at all. So just to make things a bit more concrete, here is a, 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 sort, of, a, a sort of model statement of an averaging lemma. You solve something like that with the right-hand side, so transport equals, so it's really an hyperbolic operator, equals some right-hand side where G put it in an LP and you lose as many derivatives as you want in V, but no more than one in T and X. One is important because this operator is order one in T and X. Then the velocity averages of F will be slightly more regular than what you expect. So the, the proof is not, there, there are two proofs in Fourier or not in Fourier essentially and variants of them, but they are all based on uh, the, the key simple idea that the cancellations of the symbol of this hyperbolic operator, meaning where the singularity prop can propagate, is transversal to averaging in V. So if you average in V, there is a trade-off and you still, re you still retain some sort of regularization. And then we solve the second problem, the fact that we can't apply that for something completely irregular on the right-hand side by just a comparison principle. If we take any sub-solution to our previous problem here, it is sandwiched uh, below a real solution, an exact solution. On the exact solution, we perform an averaging lemma argument and use the standard energy estimates, combine them, get regularity, Sobel F embed, and then the gain of integrability finally is inherited to the sub-solution. And we iterate. Okay, so uh, last, last thing I want to mention on this part uh, of, the, of the program is the control of oscillation. The strategy of the Georgie was really to always consider Suprema and Infima together, their difference, which is the oscillation, and to prove that this oscillation is reduced by a universal factor if you zoom uh, in a un universal way. Universal is really important here. And the main lemma is that uh, if I have a solution in a certain Q between minus one and one, then uh, uh, it, its oscillation will be this here, the oscillation is two, the oscillation will be strictly smaller in a smaller cube. It implies all the regularity by iteration, and it is itself, this lemma can be unfolded, uh, decomposed in two parts. Either you decrease the supremum bound, assuming that the solution was spending more than half of the time in, in the negative, or you increase the infimum bound, assuming the solution was spending more than half of the time in the positive. Last thing I want to say on that is that there's a very clever argument of the Georgie that we can use immediately. If you have this sort of H1 intermediate value result, then by a finite iteration, you prove what I just said, the decrease of supremum or increase of infimum. So this intermediate value resembles what you would prove in C1 by just Taylor expansion, but it's in H1. And um, you see, I assume I have some mass above one half, some mass below zero, then I must have some mass in between and all the constants are universal again. In our setting, we have much less than H1, and this statement breaks down below one half anyway, so we cannot use the argument, the, the sort of proof uh, that are used for this statement. Instead, we prove that any solution to our hypoelliptic equation satisfies exactly the same statement, except that we prove it by contradiction, letting uh, uh, taking a contradiction sequence FK and the oscillation, the diffusion matrix, sorry, AK. We have to let the diffusion matrix oscillate as well. We use all the regularity results I mentioned, IDs from homogenization to identify the limit and reach a contradiction. And it's, it's I think, a nice open problem to transform our proof from non-constructive to constructive. Because our proof is completely non-constructive and it would be nice to get information on the constants here. Okay, so last, uh, last development I would like to talk about is to focus a little bit more, is, is focusing a little bit more on supercriticality. So the conjectures say, is uh, the, the two set of conjectures I mentioned, condi conditional relaxation, essentially solved, and conditional regularity starts from the assumption that the Cauchy problem is too hard. But there's another way to try to understand something is uh, to give up working on the 
true physical equation and to write down the toy model retaining some aspects of it. A toy model that is not too simple in the sense that the Cauchy problem is still not known, a little bit hard, and try to use the new regularity tools to break down supercriticality. So here is uh, such a toy model. So it's very simple, but not too simple that you could solve it immediately. It's transport equals a, a drift diffusion equation, quadratic, non-local because of this local density that involves an integral in V. Second order, so it has, a, it has more or less the structure of a Landau equation, except that for, if, if you work on that, uh, you would know it, it does not have at all the, all the hydrodynamical structures in it. It's much simpler from this viewpoint, and it also has a lot of nice maximum principles, which also makes the study simpler. So I, I'll denote mu um, exponential minus v square over 2, which gives a stationary solution to this PDE. And with uh, Cyril Lambert, we proved that this equation is globally well posed without smallness in Sobolev spaces uh, for initial data which have bounds above and below, but for any constant C1, C2, by this uh, stationary state uh, Gaussian. And of course, these solutions, once constructed, become infinitely regular for all time. But uh, more interestingly than just the toy model, uh, really the goal is to develop a methodology for future studies. To try to, the first step is try to obtain the sharpest possible blow-up criterion by energy estimates. So try to identify the lowest order quantity that would govern the blow-up of the equation. And in our case, it turns out that for this model, it's, it, is, it turns out to be a pointwise bound on the first V gradient, but pointwise bound in X. Then use the theory I presented, so I, I won't have time to go through these steps, so I will skip them. You use the theory of gain of integrability, the iteration of the, the Georgi Moser extended, and then you use the gain of older regularity that I presented. And the fourth step is you use an extension of, of the Schauder theory for hypolyptic equations like that to obtain higher order regularity and finally control the quantity that governs the blow up. So let me skip. First thing is we have nice maximum principles that, will, that are useful for the energy estimates, but let me skip that because I will run out of time soon. So for the energy estimates, um, again, I won't have time to detail all of them, but bottom line is that you have a nice L2 estimate. You need to um, change a little bit the unknown to really work in a space of symmetry, but that is pretty much standard. You have a nice estimate in L2. When you estimate higher order in V, it is quite simple because the nonlinearity of the equation in the row does not depend on V, so you can establish sublinear estimates on the V derivatives. And finally, when you, ha uh, uh, when you look at higher order X derivatives, this is where you see the nonlinearity, and you, you use properly the symmetry of the equation, you use a bit of interpolation, and you end up with this. So this is really what you should retain from this slide, that the, all the nonlinearity is here, and the blow-up is controlled by this term in red. So by L infinity in X, L2 in V of H, and H is essentially grad V of the solution. So with this estimate, you can build a local in time solution. So that's not a big surprise, but it, it gives you that. But more interestingly, you want to perform a continuation argument, provided you have this L infinity X L2 V bound on this. This is where we use uh, the previous regularity result. So you first, perf you first apply the theory. There are a few technical twists, but let me skip that to obtain elder regularization. And once you have the elder regularization, remember the Schauder theory is essentially something that tells you if my coefficients are older, then you gain the number of derivatives you would expect for an elliptic equation. So we'll prove something of the same spirit for this hypolyptic equation. So let me just write, show you that in the last minute. You have to properly understand the scaling of the equation first. So this is the way you should scale the different variables to respect the scaling of this operator. 
it's, it's, if you remember, this is how I scaled the cubes already in my statements. This is uh, the law I should put uh, for translation that respects the Galilean uh, invariance of the transport operator. And I use these two laws to define cylinders scaling properly. And based on these cylinders, I can define a notion of older. Just you say that if I take two points in this cylinder, then it will be less than r to the power of my older regularity. It gives you older regularity that respects, gives different exponents according to different variables. So that's the good, good way to define the spaces, and you define the higher order regularity space in this way. So look at what it means. I have a regularity two plus alpha in V, and one plus alpha along transport. It is the natural uh, object uh, uh, that the equation will imply. And finally, uh, this, is, this is the core estimate in the Schauder theory, uh, but I have to explain why. The Schauder theory is, uh, there are various ways to prove it, but they all boil down to the same key steps. You say, well, if I would have constant coefficient, I would know how to prove the gain of regularity. Well, of course, because I have the fundamental solution. So it's like Fourier theory or, or whatever. Now, if, I'm, if I don't have constant coefficient, but my coefficients are a little bit regular like older, I could say that locally, the coefficients are close to their value at the center of the ball, the local ball I chose. It's a natural thing to do. However, when you do this, you generate a whole lot of error terms. And you need to control these error terms by the regularity that is implied by your constant coefficient argument. And uh, it's, it's essentially a trivial step for uh, elliptic uh, equation, but here it's not, because the regularity space we have here does not, the, sorry, regularity norm here does not control anything along t alone uh, or along x alone. So that's really an hypoelliptic problematic. We want to prove that the norm I just defined control fully uh, C1 uh, in all variables, and you, you need also that, but let's just focus on that for the intuition. And the way we prove that is we uh, perform a, a, exactly a, a commutator. So that's the geometric way to understand the Armando theory. I want to understand what happens between Txv and Tx plus R cube uv. This is a small increment in x, respecting the scaling that you should put in x. And instead of doing this, I will, I will follow this intermediate uh, path instead. I, I move a little bit along V forward, a little bit along transport forward, then a little bit along V backward, and a little bit along transport backward. So it's exactly creating a commutator. If you write down that properly, you fight a little bit for, for, for a few pages because there is a technical issue in the middle, but you have to reiterate the same idea in itself you end up with uh, this interpolation estimate, and you can close the proof. So I will stop on that, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you for your nice lecture. And do you have any questions or comments? So you first uh, mentioned the, the uh, Vacuum. Va vacuum. Va vacuum. Vacuum. Uh, do you have any uh, results on the, the formation of uh, vacuum? For, for, for formation of uh, the uh, domains where uh, uh, the solution vanishes. Solution vanishes. Vacuum. Formation of va vacuum. Do you have, a, do you know some? Formation of the space time, uh, the, uh, the region of, of uh, space where uh, solution vanish. Yeah, do you do you know any results on on such kind of problem? Yeah. So I I did not 
explain, but in kinetic theory, in a, in a box, uh, you expect that the mixing effects destroy the vacuum immediately. This is what you, you mean. Yeah, you, you, you expect that if there is vacuum in part of the domain, the thermalization process, the collision in velocity will create velocities in all directions, all amplitudes, and then these particles will spread in the whole domain. So you expect, you expect the vacuum to disappear instantaneously. Uh -huh. it's, if, it, if it's your question. Yeah. Is, yeah, sorry. So is there any chance that using um, Nash method instead of the, jo the Georgi approach, you will get some uh, other results? Some maybe, well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, uh, that, that's the goal in general. But um, I, be, before, before betting on something, you know, you need new ideas, B big nonlinear problems do not come for free. A natural idea, but I know at least Alexis Vasser has, uh, as well, and Francois Goss have tried, none of us have been able to do. It's pro it would probably be a good idea to understand what it means to perform the Georgie Moser iteration uh, in a nonlinear way, directly on an entropy functional. You know, we have to understand how to do things uh, better uh, to fit the nonlinearity of the, 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 the mathematical physical problem. So that would, I, I think, be something to at least work on. At the moment, the, the Georgie Moser method, as it is, I don't think it will break the Cauchy theory. We need, we need more, more ideas. Thank you. Any other? Uh, a curious and naive question. Your five operations in the last slide, can you switch, can you switch the order of these operations, like forward along Y, backward along Y, or is it the order important? Ah, um, no, you, you can't switch them. I mean, I don't claim this is the only path, okay. but this is, uh, if maybe if it's what you have in mind, things are non-commuting at mm. all. So the order exactly. matters. Yes. Okay. It, it, okay. It's maybe okay. what you think of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's precisely because it's not commuting that we can do something. Okay. Mm. That's, uh, it's usually, hypoelliptricity is usually presented as uh, commuting uh, vector fields instead of the path. Mm. Mm. And it's precisely because of the lack of commutativity that you create the missing directions. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Professor Miu Mu again. Thank you.